there are an extraordinary number of texts based on Shakespeare plays. According to Wikipedia, never wrong, there are 54 films based on Romeo and Juliet alone. The website is less specific when it comes to revealing all about novels and poetry based or inspired by Shakespeare, but titles such as Lady Macbeth, Prospero's Daughter, Romiet and Julio, Something's Rotten in the State of Maryland, Macbeth the King, Ophelia and Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead suggest that novelists are similarly inspired by the bard. Why is this? Why have there been so many versions and new interpretations of Shakespeare's plays? Many of these movies and novels use modern language, but explore similar ideas and themes. Given the aura that surrounds Shakespeare across the globe in the 21st century, doesn't this result in a hierarchy of literary merit, with those texts that use Shakespearean language automatically positioned above their inferior modern language counterparts? And is this right? I'd like to start by introducing you to a film in which Romeo and Juliet is transplanted to the Bronx. Love is All There Is came out in 1996, was directed by Joseph Bologna and Rennie Taylor, and starred an up-and-coming Angelina Jolie in the lead female role. There are two fierce Italian-American rival families, the Capomezzos and the Malachichis, and guess what? The Capomezzo son and the Malachichi daughter fall in love after getting cast together in the lead roles of a community production of Romeo and Juliet. There is a prologue-esque voiceover introduction within the film that sets the scene. Here food is king, and no place was more beloved than the Prince Rosario House of Capamezza Gourmet Catering and Original Wedding Design, ruled by Sadie and Mike Capamezza. More hot pepper! The Sicilian cooking was known for hot colors, spicy sauces, and jumbo portions. Then one day, there opened across the bay the Royal House of Malachichi of Florence, continental caterers and wedding couturiers, owned by real blue bloods from Italy, Count and Contessa Malachichi. And they brought City Islanders their northern Italian cuisine, dainty low fat portions, pastel colors, subtle flavors. It was inevitable between the two families. There would be bad blood. So, what do we make of this transplantation of Romeo and Juliet to the Bronx? In some ways, it's quite faithful to the original. There are two families who hate each other, although in the film they are called the Capomezzos and the Malachichis, rather than the Capulets and the Montagues. But note the same initial letter to the surnames, C and M, thus emphasising that the film is a conscious reworking of the original play. There is an early confrontation between the two families, which results in younger members of the two sides venomously abusing each other. So you're taking anybody to the charity ball after the show? Not the Bob with the pasta. How about I call Angela Mercandanti for you? Ma, don't start with me. What about I mention you to Kathy Augustina's mother and she Ma! Watch out! Idiot, you cut me off. We're going to put you out of business, you Sicilian swamp guinea. Hey, I got the right away, and you're going to put your sister's ass out of business, you 14 mountain wop. Rosario! However, there are obvious differences. In Shakespeare, the two families are both alike in dignity, whereas in the film, it is obvious that the Malachichis from authentic Italian royalty, no less, see themselves as a cut above the Capomezzos. Another factor is that whereas the feud between Shakespeare's families has resulted apparently from something trivial, bread of an airy word, in love is all there is, there is a clear professional rivalry, as they are both caterers. The Malachichi's recent arrival on the Bronx could potentially drive the Capomezzos out of business in the mid-term, so there is a far better reason for the bad blood than in Romeo and Juliet. What are the effects of these differences between the two texts? Well, the most obvious one is that 
love, love is all there is, uses the family fuse as an opportunity for comedy rather than, as in Shakespeare, a key reason for two young people feeling they have to embark upon such torturous, devious means of concealing their love, which will lead to their tragic deaths. The light-hearted tone is set as the voiceover outlines the key differences between the two businesses. Hot colours, spicy sauces and jumbo portions for the cabamezzos versus low-fat portions, pastel colours and subtle flavours for the malachichis. And continues in the early confrontation between the families as Rosario temporarily loses concentration driving the company van whilst chatting to his mother. Whereas in Shakespeare, Samson, a Capulet, deliberately plans to bite his thumb at the Montagues in order to disrespect them, here the trigger for the row is accidental, although the language used still highlights the hatred and disdain the two parties feel for each other. And of course, I've now indirectly come to the key point about Shakespearean adaptations, the language. The language in Shakespeare is generally seen as sacrosanct, the living blood through which his eternal greatness flows, if you like. And so should productions which only, and I use only in inverted commas, use plot strands, ideas and themes from his plays, be seen as lesser texts, to be brushed aside contemptuously by academics and literature students. The early confrontation in Shakespeare is preceded by some complex punning, some testosterone fueled banter between two Capulet men, Samson and Gregory. Gregory of my word will not carry coals. No, for then we should be colliers. I mean, and we be in collar will draw. I, while you live, draw your neck out of the collar. I wonder how many of us on a first or second reading or listening would fully understand the intricate wordplay here. When Samson says that they won't carry coals, he is using a now obsolete proverbial phrase meaning to submit to insults, presumably here from a Montague man. Gregory developed Samson's image by declaring that if they were to allow themselves to be insulted, they would effectively be dirty, cheating colliers. Samson then puns or develops colliers into collar, meaning how angry they would be to be insulted, so much so that it would result in them whipping out their swords to fight. And I think there is an undercurrent of low-level sexual punning here, with drawing also potentially referring to their mighty manhoods. The punning is developed yet further, as Gregory suggests that Samson should avoid being hung for as long as possible. The pun is seen in using a different meaning for the word that sounds as collar. Samson means angry, Gregory means the collar or noose from a hangman. Given that the stage directions declare that the men are armed with swords and bucklers, small shields, aggressive tones of voice and macho backslapping are likely to make general meaning fairly obvious, i.e. the two men are boasting about their physical prowess and willingness to fight their enemy should the occasion merit it. But I return to my previous question. How many audience members are likely to fully understand the convoluted multiple word place? Yes, they are likely to hear the similarities in sound between coals, colliers, collar and collar and suspect that some word play is afoot, but given the likely aggressive rapidity of line delivery, few will pick up on the details and associations of carrying coals and colliers. The confrontation between the families, in love is all there is, uses modern English. The Malachichi van driver calls Rosario a Sicilian swamp guinea, meaning obnoxious white trash, vowing to put his family out of business, to which the latter retorts by calling his rival a Florentine mountain wop. These insults are comic in their rubbishing of different Italian origins and the preference for urban slang ahead of coarse everyday expletives. Yet, isn't a road rage-esque exchange something a modern audience can relate more closely to than the apparently deadly decision to bite a thumb in someone's direction? Certainly the language in Love is All There Is is less pun-ridden and easier to understand than in Shakespeare's original. So on a language level, does this make it a less academic, inferior text? 
But in some ways, there is greater complexity in the film, as it includes the Shakespearean device of a play within a play that is not present in Romeo and Juliet. Rosario Capomezzo's family hate the Malachichis, yet following an injury to the original enormous girl cast to play Juliet, he ends up playing Romeo opposite a Juliet who in real life, or at least within the film, is from that self-same abhorred family. This allows us to think about and enjoy, like Theseus and co at the end of A Midsummer Night's Dream, the artificiality of the theatrical experience. Just as Hamlet, and therefore the audience, is more interested in watching Claudius's reaction to the mousetrap than the play within a play itself, so here in Love Is All There Is, the camera frequently zooms in on the reactions of the two families as they watch their children reenacting Romeo and Juliet's tragic final moments. Thy drugs are quick, thus with a kiss I die. Hmm. Sicilian trick in the back of the book. But why she don't stop him? Tell me why. Because she has to act as if she's dead. And he's taking advantage. No, no, no. The blessed rascal, no. Hey, that's what masculine acting is. You kiss the girl like you go for her. Her aura is changing. What? Nothing. The acting of Rosario and Gina as Romeo and Juliet is obviously amateur and over the top, whilst the extended final kisses show the pair blatantly using the cover of playing renowned lovers, perhaps the most famous lovers in literature, to express their own passionate feelings. The irony in comedy is that the pair are kissing in front of around 100 people, including their parents who loathe each other, yet the convention of an audience never interrupting events on stage within a dramatic production gives them the freedom to kiss in a way which they have been unable to do prior to this point. Count Malachichi gets up numerous times to try to bring the passion to a halt, although others in the row are not impressed, with one complaining, you've got some nerve fat so, yet he is never successful, which also reflects the impotence of the parents in Rome and Juliet and their failure to control their children's relationship. So watching this play within a play, Rome and Juliet, and the reactions of those in the film to the play actually reinforces one of the key messages of Shakespeare's original, albeit within a comic way. In Romeo and Juliet, Juliet's father Capulet may threaten her as much as he likes. In Act 3, Scene 5, his horrendous abuse includes the statement that we have a curse in having her. But ultimately, Juliet has married without his consent, and his desire to control her is therefore futile and destructive. And this scene in Love is All There Is highlights the ineffectiveness of parents trying to regulate youthful passion. They even have to witness it, along with 100 other gawping members of the community. But perhaps the director is doing something else here. Note that the extended kiss does not come when Rosario and Gina deliver the final lines of the sonnet in Act 1, Scene 5, in which they come together for the very first time. But it happens at the end of the play, when we are supposed to be in tears at the tragedy of Romeo, not knowing that Juliet isn't actually dead, which causes him and then her to kill themselves. Gina as Juliet is supposed to be in a deep sleep, like death, but not actually dead. Yet, as Romeo gives her a final kiss, she responds passionately, sighing in a snog that lasts for a full 75 seconds. And yes, I did time it. You would not snog someone you thought was dead, I hope. 
And so the effect is to remove all tragedy from the on-stage deaths and to return the focus to the comic conflict between the Capomezzos and the Malachichis. You could also argue that this play within a play brings home both the pointlessness of the two teenagers' deaths in Romeo and Juliet and, through the ludicrously extended kiss, pokes fun at the conveniently tragic timing. In Shakespeare, Juliet wakes up no more than a minute after Romeo has drunk the, the ap apothecary's quick drugs, meaning that in this production she would never have died. I'd like to now to turn to a production of Roman Juliet, which uses Shakespeare's original language. Baz Luhrmann's celebrated William Shakespeare's Romeo plus Juliet. Notes not and, but plus, presumably to give it a slightly edgier feel. This is the film that is used remorselessly in GCSE English classes across the country, lauded as making Shakespeare accessible, cool and fun. Here's an extract from towards the beginning of the film. which is a disgrace to them if they bear it. Huh? I previously talked about the potential barriers to full understanding within a Shakespearean play. Obscure puns made obscure by evolution in how the English language is pronounced. And there is no doubt that Lerman's visual clues are helpful. The Capulet boys, the Montague boys, come up on captions on screen to highlight the different families' obsessively strong sense of, of their own identities. And there are also close-ups of two different coats of arms, which can be found beneath their gun's handles. Viewers of this production will be in no doubt very early on as to just how much the families hate each other, which of course is also Shakespeare's key aim of the first scene. The hatred needs to be clear so that we understand why Romeo and Juliet feel they need to behave so furtively. But the extent to which Lerman has butchered Shakespeare's original text needs to be pointed out. Just as in Love is All There Is, the complex wordplay is completely cut from the scene. There are no puns on coals, colliers, collar and collar. The sexual wordplay is largely transferred to the unsubtlety of generous pelvic thrusts. And Lerman, in his quest to stick to Shakespeare's language, even sticks together phrases from other Shakespearean plays, most notably in this extract, Hubble, Bubble, Toil and Trouble, adapted from Macbeth. In Macbeth, the original phrase, double, double, toil and trouble, comes in Act 4, Scene 1 when the witches are chanting and mixing together random human and animal body parts before Macbeth enters to demand answers. Here in Lerman's production, the meaning is watered down from being a devilish chant aimed at securing supernatural assistance to a more simplistic declaration that trouble is afoot as the enemy family have arrived at the same petrol station. Yes, Lerman, unlike the directors of Love is All There Is, retains the original trigger for the fight, the thumb biting rather than a road rage incident. But beyond this, much of the tension is built up by dramatic music, screeching car tires, extreme close-ups of eyes and gunfighting rather than Shakespeare's language, which would predominantly have been the case when Romeo and Juliet was first performed. A comparison of the word counts of the Montague Capulet dispute in Act 1, Scene 1 is revealing. 
Shakespeare's original, 497 words. Lerman's version, 252, which includes the phrase adapted from Macbeth and other additions including boo, ah, ha, ha, ooh, boo, ha, 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 and bang, 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 bang. Now, of course, cuts to Shakespeare when producing films are commonplace, unless you happen to be an evangelical Kenneth Branagh. And Lerman himself said this in an interview. Well, actually, Shakespeare's always cut, you know, a third to a half, usually. But what I want to question is this. If a production uses Shakespeare's text, but cuts huge sections and twists other sections beyond all recognition, should this text necessarily be seen as a superior one to one which uses modern English, but dapples and plays with the same ideas, themes and motivations from the original? Should Baz Luhrmann's film be seen as the must-have for any pupil studying Romeo and Juliet, whilst the mountain of films inspired by the text, but using modern language, including Love Is All There Is, be seen as the never-have? But I certainly wouldn't want to dismiss the beauty and potency of much of Shakespeare's language, and the most notable examples of this in Romeo and Juliet can be found during the lovers' exchanges. During the extravagant Capulet party, Romeo and Juliet first meet, and in their very first interaction, they share a sonnet, a 14-line poem with a rigid meter and rhyming structure traditionally associated with love. The sonnet contains repeated religious imagery in which Romeo refers to Juliet as a religious shrine which he, as an eager metaphorical pilgrim, is desperate to touch and kiss. What girl wouldn't be flattered by such devotional words? Or indeed, what boy, as is the case in the next film I'm going to talk about? Private Romeo was directed by Alan Brown and came out in 2011. It is set in a fictional, prestigious military academy in the USA. Eight cadets are left behind and instructed to follow their usual routine, which includes drills, PE exercises, and furthering their understanding of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet within their literature classes. The film shows the young men reading the text jokingly, albeit diligently, within the classroom. But outside the text generally begins to take over and absorb, as two cadets begin to see each other in a different light. Here's a flavour. Tell me, daughter Juliet, how stands your dispositions to be married? It is an honour that I dream not of. Oh, an honour? <laughs> I like your kicks, man. That's nice. Thanks. What is that? Is that like a... Oh, that's the list joint. Yeah. That's yeah, cool. Yeah. I like that a lot. And what's this the right there? Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. If I profane with my unworthiest hand this holy shrine, <laughs> the gentle sin is this. My lips, two blushing pilgrims ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. Hey. <laughs> Saints do not move. They'll grant for prayer's sake. Then move not while my prayer's effect I take. <sighs> Give me my sin again. my flesh tremble in the different greeting. Shakespeare's sonnet is left completely unchanged, although the preceding gentle compliments, I like your kicks, ma'am, those are nice, are obviously modern additions. The dialogue between the furious onlocker using Tybalt's lines and his party-holding uncle is heavily cut, whilst Tybalt's objections are positioned later in the scene so they comment explicitly on the kissing between the two men, rather than in Shakespeare's original, Romeo's simple presence. Swigging his beer, he sees the two men uncovering their sexuality, perhaps for the first time, and declares, thee makes my flesh tremble in the different greeting. 
Whereas in Shakespeare, Tybalt's flesh is trembling with the patience forced upon him by his uncle and his feelings of anger. In this film, the meaning has been changed so that he is creeped out by homosexuality. During an interview about the film, the director Alan Brown explained that the film was his rumination on homophobia, and more specifically, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which at the time um, we made the film was not yet overturned. The Don't Ask, Don't Tell was the US policy on military service by, by homosexuals, which was in place between 1994 and 2011. It went like this. Openly gay people were not allowed to serve, whereas those that were secretly and discreetly homosexual should not be discriminated against and were allowed. So this film appropriates Shakespeare for political purposes, with the specific aim of attacking a ludicrous piece of legislation within the US Army, and a general aim of influencing attitudes towards homosexuality. Why does Brown use Shakespeare as the medium for these goals? There's a few reasons, I think. Firstly, Romeo and Juliet seems to be seen as one of the greatest love stories of all time, irrespective of the fact that the pair are so young, barely know each other, and die so quickly. To add further detail to this description, it is implicitly seen as one of the greatest heterosexual love stories of all time. By reallocating the famous lines to two male characters, the, the director is tacitly positioning homosexual love on the same level as heterosexual, and thus suggesting the equality of both. Secondly, I think Brown uses Shakespeare because the imagery is frequently so beautiful. Who cannot be moved by the poetry of lines which refer to lips as two blushing pilgrims, and declare that placing palm on palm is a kiss shared by the holy, irrespective of whether we see a woman and a man drawing closer to each other, or a man and a man. Doesn't the beauty of Shakespeare's language have the potential to, even if only temporarily, override prejudices? But of course Brown is following the casting conventions from Shakespeare's own time in choosing young men to play the female parts. Is there an argument for suggesting, therefore, that his change is more faithful than modern interpretations in his reintroduction of homoerotic tensions that rowdy Elizabethan audiences would have adored. But more widespread returning to all male casts, even if representative of the Elizabethan stage and potentially helpful in reducing remaining prejudices about male homosexuality, causes other problems if we accept the premise that Shakespeare is political as much as a playwright. Emma Rice, the new artistic director at Shakespeare's Globe in London has set a target of a 50-50 gender balance on stage and said in an interview with The Guardian in January, as somebody who has got custody of this canon for a while, I think it's quite interesting to say, yes, it is a target. How can we get the female voices through? How can we change the mould? So do those putting on Shakespeare productions need to be treated similarly to those naughty companies in the FTSE 100 who don't have a single woman on their boards? Are you giving equal opportunities to all, particularly underrepresented women? If Shakespeare could have male actors playing female parts, then why shouldn't we now have females play male roles? Or, to return to Rice, there is no reason why Gloucester from King Lear can't be a woman. If anybody bended gender, it was Shakespeare. So I think it just takes a change of mindset. But I think dangers lie with these appropriations of Shakespeare for current political purposes. Can they be used in the name of increasing awareness of, say, discrimination against homosexuals and women to increase other prejudices? The text I'm thinking of is Jeanette Winterson's novel, The Gap of Time part of the Hogarth Shakespeare project launched in October 2015, in which acclaimed and best-selling novelists retell Shakespeare's works. The Gap of Time by Jeanette Winterson is a retelling of Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale, which memorably starts with Leontes, the king of Sicilia, suddenly becoming convinced that his wife Hermione has been having an affair with his best friend Polixenes, the king of Bohemia. There is no basis whatsoever for his accusation, 
and Leontes behaves appallingly. He packs off his heavily pregnant queen to jail. He orders one of his followers to poison Polixenes. He refutes Apollo's judgment on the matter, which of course revealed his wife's innocence and his own tyranny. His son, Mamilius, dies as a result of the ensuing trauma. And when Hermione gives birth, he orders the baby to be taken from her and dispatched to fend for itself on wild foreign shores. Shakespeare unquestionably presents Leontes as a man whose behaviour is utterly abhorrent in the first half of the play. But is Winterson justified in transforming Leontes into someone who rapes his heavily pregnant wife and choosing to describe this rape in eye-watering detail? In her novel, The Gap of Time, the Leontes character is called Leo, his wife is Mimi, and the accused man is Zeno. Leo was pulling his shirt over his head. Mimi lifted her hand and touched his chest. He grabbed her hand like he was steadying himself from falling. Too hard, said Mimi, but Leo held her harder. He bent low over her, sliding his body flat, his other hand on her throat. For a second she thought it was a game, and then she knew it was not. Leo! Did you sleep with him before the show, or did you have a quickie when you came back and helped him pack? Leo! Laisse-moi! Leo had unzipped his trousers. He needed both hands to get them off. Mimi moved to get out of bed. He pulled her down. How long have you been having an affair with Zeno? He saw her face. Disbelief. They never thought he'd find out. You cheap slut! Leo had Mimi on her side, one hand over her mouth. She was biting him like a dog. She was a dog. He tried to get his penis inside her from behind, but she was struggling. He didn't want to hit her. Leo got up, forced her legs open with his knee. I know all about you, he said. Mimi suddenly stopped struggling. She turned on her back, panting, one hand on her belly. You know nothing about me. Leo was low over her body, his weight on his arms either side of her, his face close to hers. He wanted to kiss her. He wanted to cry. You're mine. Say you're mine. Mimi said nothing. How does he touch you? Does he lie next to you, on top of you? Does he do oriental massage? Does he rub your temples? Does he go down on you like I do? Do you like that? Do you like it? Leo shook her. She was floppy, like a just-dead person. She didn't move under him the way he liked. She didn't whisper to him in French. He loved that. She lay still like an animal being beaten. He couldn't come. He kept pumping, but he couldn't come. He leaned to kiss her. She bit his top lip. He felt the blood running into his mouth. Bitch! He hit her across the face. Whereas in Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale, Leontes accuses his wife of betraying him publicly in front of numerous lords and ladies, thus humiliating someone with such a sharp sense of decorum, here in The Gap of Time, Leo is far more Othello-like in choosing to accuse in private in bed. Although Winterson softens Leo's behaviour by presenting his mixed emotions, he didn't want to hit her, he wanted to kiss her, he wanted to cry, her portrayal nonetheless resorts to the tired cliché of men trying to exert control over women through violence and sex, the latter forced if necessary. Winterson shows that this male desire to control through sex is ultimately unfulfilling. He kept pumping, but he couldn't come. I must declare a vested interest here, in that as a young, passionate English literature student at Warwick University in the late 1990s, I was dismayed to learn from a gossipy PhD student lecturer that Jeanette Winterson once had a lesbian affair with the wife of my favourite author, Julian Barnes. The affair didn't last, and Barnes and his wife got back together. But since then, perhaps I have conjured up illusory impressions of Winterson's perspective on men and relationships. In an interview with The Guardian in 2010, she jokingly reveals that the tabloids have long had me down as this lesbian marriage wrecker vampire from hell. 
But to return to the gap of time, I cannot help but feel that the transformation of Leontes into not just a rapist, but a rapist of a heavily pregnant wife, reveals more about the writer's own, often laudable agenda to fight passionately for women's rights within society, rather than what Shakespeare presents in the text. And my conclusion is that the gap of time is weaker for this. So how to conclude this tip of the iceberg talk about exploring texts based on Shakespeare and the motivations for filmmakers and novelists? Well, as shown in Love Is All There Is, playing with Shakespeare can be bloody good fun. As perhaps a story in which innocent teenagers sneak around and disobey parents to explore their sexuality should be, irrespective of inter-family tensions. There can also be an understandable desire to simplify and cut Shakespeare's language to broaden appeal, as Lerman does so successfully in his acclaimed 1996 movie version of the play. But at what cost? And then there's the undeniable fact that Shakespeare has become a vehicle for political purposes. In Private Romeo, director Alan Brown uses the world's most famous love story to, in his words, ruminate on homophobia and repressive US military policy on homosexuality, which incidentally was successful in that the same year the film came out, the don't ask, don't tell policy was scrapped. Novelists also enjoy reinterpreting the bard, but as I think Jeanette Winterson unwittingly reveals in The Gap of Time, we cannot help but reveal something of ourselves, including our own prejudices, when we make the brave step of putting pen to paper. And my own view of all these multiple reinterpretations and rewritings? Well, I think it is a wonderful thing that 400 years after his death, Shakespeare's work continues to inspire and provoke thought and debate. And isn't the great thing about live theatre is that each time you go to watch a play, even one you know, the experience will be slightly different each time. A line will be delivered with a slightly different emphasis. The casting of a particular character will raise an eyebrow, such as Derek Jacobi playing Mercutio at a production of Romeo and Juliet I saw earlier this year in London. A particular set may cause us to reconsider altogether our interpretation of a particular moment. And this is what is happening on a much larger scale within these reinterpretations and rewritings. Our minds return to the original Shakespeare and reflect and reconsider. This could only be a good thing.